the theme of our conference series here, Bobby? <laughs> Gina, no, Jesus. <laughs> every year. So every, every single conference is reminding us all our hope is in Jesus. And you look around in the auditorium and in the back and up on the screen, uncommon. And what a, what a really uh, neat theme it is going to point our, our, our uh, whole week and our uh, whole time together to faith and the faithfulness that we are to have to the faithful one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Wasn't that great just to be able to get singing and, and get warmed up and uh, fired up in the spirit of God? That's a good thing to do since they've canceled the rest of the chief seasons because a couple people are sick. Yeah, and I heard that, right? Is that true? They didn't? Well, they canceled the game, right? No? Postpone. Is there a difference between postpone and canceled? I called and I asked the NFL if they would cancel all football games this week so we could have our conference, and they said, no problem. What a wonderful organization. They said, boy, great, so you can just talk about Jesus. See, they brought that up. No, they didn't. Just kidding. But we're here together, and I'm so glad that you chose to be here this morning. It's often said, there is no accident to how God gathers everyone together. And we've been praying, many of you have been praying and preparing to be here, and uh, we're here, and we're off and running. Thank you for the beautiful music and, and the singing and the team of people that have prepared and spent time to be here and prepared, as I say, prepared the stuff. But uh, the stuff also, too, leads to a place of where we need to prepare our hearts. And so even now, I pray that the music and the worship and the time of singing has prepared your heart. You've been in prayer already, and we've had a time of prayer. And uh, old Milt, man, where's Milt? Where'd he go? Did he leave? Did Milt leave? Milt, you still got a little bit left in the, in the tank for 89 years old. You're doing all right. No, he's not that old, but what a blessing. What a blessing to see young and old on the stage praising God. That's a beautiful picture. Thank you for your faithfulness to God. Thank you, Milt. What a great song. Still got a little bit left in that, uh, in that voice, and that's powerful because it's of the Lord. This morning, we're going to hear from the Lord. And uh, last year, we had a great conference with, uh, with Brian, and of course, the Callaways were here, and praise God, they started out on uh, a little bit of a respite and headed back to Africa, and uh, things have been a little bit different. He'll talk a little bit about that. And so here he is again. We can't get rid of him. Amen. Oh. Amen. 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 It's been so much to me, personally, to have him around. He's been a very dear friend for many, many years, and uh, been through some little, little and some big together, but it's proven God's faithfulness in our lives. And Brian is um, part of the fruit of First Bible Baptist Church in early years of uh, the fruit of the gospel of Jesus Christ transforming his life, being discipled and, and trained and mentored and, and led most of all by the Lord Jesus Christ, by the Word of God, by the Holy Spirit of God to show himself and prove himself powerful and strong in a son of God to follow after the son of God. And when a few years went back it, and God called him to the mission field, it was uh, truly a, just a great and special time for our church. And so to have him here for this conference uh, just proves, of course, God's faithfulness, but he is God's faithful man. And uh, we want to hear from him this morning, and, and uh, he's got all the time in the world, we don't have to be out of here till 5 o'clock to clean everything up for our 5.30 service. So does that sound okay? Okay, they got two people say it's fine, praise the Lord. No, he's ready to preach the word of God and, and come and bless us. We want to hear from him and hear from the Lord. So please welcome Pastor Missionary Brian Calloway. Amen. Am I on? Yeah, praise the Lord. Balesa Bachin Dikwe means to God be the glory, right? Amen. So Mabukashani, we're doing a test here to see how many of you remember from last year how to respond to that. 
Because I told you last year how to say good morning. Then I also taught you how to uh, say good morning back. So, Mabukashani. Yeah, who, who said that? Amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah, so you say Nabuka Bueno, right? Mabukashani. Nabuka Bueno. Amen. And then, Valesa uh, Bawe, man. God is good. And Pindi Shonse all the time. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, uh, you know, we did not plan this, honestly, but God had planned this for us to be back here this year. Um, a lot of changes have taken place throughout this year, and uh, I think all of you can give testimony to that. Um, you know, last time this year, I, had, you know, I was asked to, to be able to speak here at the conference and to preach here at the conference, and uh, it was a blessing, it was awesome, it was, I was honored, you know, it was the first time I really had the opportunity to get up at a conference and speak the whole time, and it was humbling, and it was honoring, um, and glorifying unto God, and uh, you know our plan, our plan was to go back in May of last year, and, uh, but as most of you know, Miss Tammy had some strokes at the end of December, and uh, that was not what kept us from going back. Yes, we had to readjust. We had to work through this. Um, but we were still planning on going back to Zambia in May, just like we had normally planned. And, but obviously the COVID hit. And when COVID hit, that shut down all international flight and, and travel. And we weren't able to go. Um, and as many of you know, uh, uh, missionary John Sarah, Kafulufuta, after being there for 20 plus years, passed away. And so... Through all of this, we're looking at how can we give back to have a memorial for him. Um, and even that wasn't able to happen because of the shutdown. But, um, but I think most of you know, I, in August, I had the opportunity to go back to Zambia to be able to share some things um, that God is doing and uh, in the direction that God has taken our family and taking GCMS, God's Christian Missionary Service, um, and the ministry over there. And, um, and then a few weeks ago, our pastor announced that we would be coming off the field. And as much of a shock that was maybe to some of you, it was just as much shock to us when God had spoken to us about this. We weren't expecting it. When ta um, I'll be giving more of a testimony of detail tomorrow night. Um, but yet at the same time, uh, and, and we're looking forward to that because I, you know, you, this is my family. You guys are my family. Um, like, like Brownie said, that I got saved in this church, I got trained up in this church, I got sent out in this church, and there's no other place I would rather be than when God's will, right? That's the best place to be. And I can tell you this, though, that God made it clear to me that, because sometimes missionaries, when they come off the field, they go to different places, but God made it clear that we we're supposed to come back to First Bible, and this is our home, and I'm um, so thankful to be able to come back and minister alongside of you. Um, but we weren't expecting it. A verse that we live by is Proverbs 16, 9. And you've probably heard me mention it many times. It says, as a man's heart deviseth his way, the Lord directed his steps. And so we started going a certain direction and God just redirected us. And throughout the summer, God was speaking to our hearts and, and came up with the decision that he had already made the decision. It just had to be me to say yes or no, right? And so we said yes. And so now God has led us back here and and I'll be going back to Zambia soon, taking care of a few things, and I'll explain more of that tonight. But say, first off, thank you guys for all your prayers. Um, you're, we wouldn't have been able to do what we did if it wasn't for your prayers, if it wasn't for your financial support, if it wasn't for your encouragement and all that you guys did for us. So as you honored us, we want to honor you back and share with you the details of all that God's doing so that way we can all be on the same page, move in the same direction, amen? And actually goes along with what we're speaking on today. You know, the theme of this conference is uncommon, and uh, it's kind of an interesting theme, and it's a wonderful theme, and I love how uh, God used this verse, and I'm going to share more this week when it's time when God says so about how much this verse, Proverbs 26, means to me. It has so much more meaning than you could even imagine, and I'll share it with you guys um, this week. But out of this message, or I'm sorry, out of this this theme comes this, um, or out of this verse, I'm sorry, comes this theme, uncommon. And when you take a look at it, actually, it's kind of a negative thing. But it's a positive thing all at the same time, right? Negatron, proton, all at the same time, it's working together. And where God had landed me within this theme is what you see up here is bookends of righteousness. That's the title of today's message. It's 
the bookends of righteousness, is really connected to faithfulness. And uh, each message that I preach this week, you know, we're going to have the opportunity tonight to hear Bobby preach and to share some really intimate things when it comes to Kapula Futa. And I'm really excited about hearing Pastor Alex Chippy preach. He's a, he's a good man. Man, I can't speak enough about that man. But, uh, but with my messages, you're going to see a lot about bookends because that's where God has led me. So when you take that theme or title of today, Bookends of, un- of Righteousness and Uncommon Integrity, we'll, we'll dive into that. But it all begins with this verse, Proverbs 20, verse 6. We're going to read this verse, I'm going to pray, and then we'll get into the message. It says here, Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Father God, right now, we just ask that you would... Uh, working in and through us today as as your church. Lord, I know that here today there are many that's uh, trusted in you, Jesus. You are our hope. And we bought into the fact that you are our Savior. And we there came a time in our lives where we bowed the knee and asked you to come into our lives and save us. And we thank you for that. And I pray for those who do know you that you will work in the midst of us today, <clears throat> that your spirit might move, convict, and bring us to a point of decision-making. And Lord, I also know that within a group this size, within a church body, within a building this size, I should say, that there are people that don't know Jesus as their Savior. And Lord, I just ask and pray that the Holy Spirit would today convict their hearts and help them to come into the fold. And Lord God, teach us today, starting today, throughout this week, what it means to be uncommon, what it means to be faithful, what it means to live out the life of Jesus Christ. That's what we're looking forward to, God, and that's what we're directed towards, and we're just asking that you would lead us, lead your church to have the uncommon faith in this world today. We, and Lord, we just ask that you would meet with us and speak in and through me today as I am your vessel and open up the hearts of the hearers. We'll give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this says that most men proclaim everyone his own goodness, but what it doesn't say, it doesn't say all men. It says most, so that gives us a little bit of hope, knowing that there are men and women out there that have bought into the fact of who Jesus Christ is, and that they are proclaiming the goodness of Jesus Christ himself. There's a lot of faithful men out there. There's a lot of faithful women out there, but it is uncommon in today's age. It really is, and we're going to get in and look at some scripture of uh, of what the Bible says about today's age. I mean, I think of right now, men in my life that are still there. They're still at it. My pastor, Mark Brown, wow, he's invested so much into me. He's my friend, you know? And we've been there since, since I've been here. He's been there by my side. Uh, pastor Bobby Bonner, wow, the way he's invested into me to prepare me to go over to Kafula Futsa and to Zambia. He's faithful. There's a man by the name of Pastor Gif Kapika in Zambia, Pastor Elijah Pule, Pastor Alex Chippy, who's over here right now, and many more. You guys can go down and run down the list of names of men and women who are faithful. And I guarantee you there are men and women and faithful that you don't even know their names. You don't even know they're there. And one day they'll be revealed. But here's the thing. There are faithful men out there that God has called to fulfill his word. But true faithfulness, now this is something we have to look at. True faithfulness is 100%, which can only be found in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the 100% faithful, true living God. He fulfilled the will of God. God gave him, the Father gave him a will. He came down here and fulfilled it. He was without sin. He lived the life that God had him to live without failure. Now see, we can't do that. We've all failed one way or another, right? But we have something to attain towards because Jesus Christ is our standard. The Bible shows us that Jesus Christ is the one that we work towards. Jesus Christ is the one that we are conformed to if we choose to on a daily basis. We must be striving for this standard of faithfulness. That's what this is. That's what this uncommon is. This standard of faithfulness found in Jesus Christ. It should be common. It should be common. It should be what is the norm of this church. Think of how different this world would look if every church member lived the life of faithfulness that God has called them to. How would this world look? It would be a lot different, right? But we have the opportunity to do so. 1 Thessalonians 5, or chapter 5, verse 24 says, 
Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. It's our God, our Lord, who has called us. But you know, it's interesting in this verse. He is the one who's faithful. But there's a, the second half of the verse says, oh, by the way, he's the one that's going to do it. See, we're just a vessel. That's all we are. We're just a conduit. The Spirit comes in and it runs out. I'll never forget um, a, a message years ago or that we heard from uh, 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 Doug Ripley. You know, God will never give to you what he'll give through you, right? He'll give it through you. And that's the way we're supposed to live our life. He's the faithful one. He's the one that calls us to the ministry. He's the one that calls us into the walk with him and wherever he may lead us, lead us but he's the one that's going to do it, not us. We can't do it on our own. See, faithful men and women are not found. A faithful man, who can find? You know what? We cannot find a faithful man or woman. A faithful man and woman, can they be found? The answer is no. They're not found. They're revealed. See, God is the one who reveals the faithfulness. They're not found. I can't just go out there and look for one. But when I'm not looking one, guess what? God will reveal the faithful that are out there. Through a lifetime of actions, through a lifetime of proving, God is going to reveal the heart. He's going to reveal the faithfulness over time. It takes time to reveal that. There's a lot that God has to chip away in our lives in order to get us to a place to where we're even willing to say, yes, I will follow you with 100% of my life. It's called uh, sanctification. God is continually working in our lives. See, what's inside of a person, eventually it works its way out. This is why God brings testing in our lives. It shows us how we will respond. Proverbs 21 verse 2 says this, Every way of man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. You know, again, like I said earlier, Brownie taught me this, he, that not all things good are right. There's a lot of good things out there. There's a lot of great things you can do for the Lord and of the Lord, but they're not even always the right thing to do because you have to know what God's calling you to do in order to do the right thing. Amen? But every way of man is right in his own eyes. You know, the way that I was taking my family was to Central America. I really thought, and that was a good thing. That was the way I was going years ago. But here, this says right here in this verse, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. You know what that word pondereth means? It means to measure. It means to prove. It means to test. So even though that way was right, God brought some proving and some testing into my life to really work out of me what he was doing in and through me. And he made it clear to me that we were supposed to be in Zambia, not Central America. See, it was right, but God made it clear and he proved me. God proves our hearts, not so he can find out who we are, but so we can find out who we are. He, he already knows who we are. He wants us to know who we are. But many of us are fighting that continually on a daily basis. We've got our own ideas and plans and thoughts, and some are admirable, some aren't. Some are biblical, some are not. But God, what he's going to do is he's going to bring that time to proving and testing in your life. Why? Because he wants you to know where you're at. He wants you to know where you stand before a true, living, holy God. The approach that we must take when you look at this message and when you look at what we're doing, and it's not just this message, it's an entire approach of life, you have to take it as if you're looking through a lens of the kingdom of God. Now, last year, I spoke on the kingdom of God, and I spoke on God's kingdom, and there's one kingdom, and yes, there is. And that's the filter that we have to look through. We have to look through a kingdom lens. We have to look through a king's lens. Because if we're not looking through that type of lens, we're not going to know exactly what we're supposed to be doing. See, there's an assumption that you and I already understand when we get into the Word that we're speaking from a spiritual context. If you do not approach the Word of God with a spiritual context, with the lens that we're speaking of, then it's going to be hard to discern out of Scripture what God is wanting to do in your life. And you might get the wrong message because you're not looking with the wrong eyes. See, the Bible is a book of contrasts. And in the contrast, when you're looking through the right lens, God's going to 
give you that spiritual thought process. He's going to help you see spiritually. But if not, you're going to be looking at it through worldly. So you got spiritual, you have world. See, with this being a book of contrast, when you get into the Word of God, God's going to show you what's right. He's going to show you what's wrong. He's going to show you faithfulness. He's going to show you unfaithfulness. He's going to show me, Brian, when I'm obedient. He's going to show me, Brian, when I'm disobedient. Good and evil, common and uncommon. When, with each one of these, and that list can go on and on. It's not just stuck here in these. But with each decision that we make, whether spiritually or worldly, there is a consequence. And how we respond to what God's doing in our life, it's going to have an eternal impact. It may have a temporal impact also, but it will have an eternal impact. So, again, like I said, when last year at this time, when I was talking about the kingdom of God and from cover to cover, it's teaching us a theme of a kingdom. There's also many other themes in there. One of the themes that God teaches us is from cover to cover, we see that there's an issue. And the issue is this, it's the heart of man. That's the issue. From the very beginning to the very end, I remember I was talking to Milt right before this service, and um, when I got saved, right, I was young, I was on fire, I was like a sponge, I just couldn't get enough of God. And I thought, I'm going to read through the Bible, right? You know, I set down on that quest. And so I start from Genesis, and I start reading this book. And I found a, a friend of mine that I went to, and I said, hey. He goes, yeah. I said, I think I got the wrong Bible. And he goes, why? And he goes, because these people are messed up. I mean, <laughs> you see what's going on in Genesis. I mean, it was really messed up people. Because, see, I expected to open it, and it would be like, oh, you know, all this light to, just to pour out. And then God was just showing me. He's like, no, Brian, let me just tell you. That goes to show you that we have a problem. And you know what? And God works through people. And people back then dealt with the same things that we're dealing with now. It was wonderful. It taught me a lesson. And it gave me a hope that I didn't have to live up to a standard that I cannot fulfill. But God has given us the path to live up to a standard that we can fulfill if we walk within righteousness. Amen? So we have a heart issue. God is trying to change our hearts all the time in every day that we walk through because we have a battle for our heart. And Proverbs 15, 11 says this, Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? You know, if the hearts of men, because we refuse to follow God, leads us to a place called hell, and it can lead us to a place called destruction, even on this life. And if that is before God, how much more are our hearts before him? Because he knows what's in our hearts. He knows what needs to be changed. So God is trying to change us from the inside out. And he uses the verse, the theme verse, and help us to understand these things. See, it's a heart of arrogance or it's a heart of humility. Are we going to be arrogant about who we are as a church or even maybe a lost person? Or are we going to humble ourselves before a true living God? See, you can go ahead and turn your Bibles if you have them to uh, Revelation chapter 3. That's where we're going to be. Because in Revelation chapter 3 is going to reveal to us the commonality of the church today. That's where the common church is today. And see, we must first see where we are in order to know where God wants us to be. Remember, God has a standard, and that standard is Jesus Christ. And in Revelation chapter 3, God's going to show us through his very own words, the words of Christ, his standard and how much we are failing. Now, what's interesting about these churches, the books of the, the, that was written by John through Jesus Christ, Jesus gave him the words, John wrote to these seven churches, right? But I think it's very interesting, and honestly, I, maybe I learned this a long time ago and I'd forgotten, but I saw it when I was studying this out, that he wrote to seven churches, but the first six churches are different from the seventh church. He writes to the church of Ephesus. He writes to the church of Smyrna. He says, unto the church of Pergamos. He says, of the church of Thyatira, of the church of Sardis. And then he says, of the church of Philadelphia. But the Holy Spirit changed the verbiage when it comes to our church. 
when it comes to this church. Because he doesn't say to the church of. Listen to this. He says, and of the church of the Laodiceans. He doesn't say the church of Laodicea. He says the church of the Laodiceans. I think that's very interesting. Because what God has shown me through this is that this is an individual issue. He's dealing with individuals in this church age. So when John wrote the, these seven churches, he wrote to seven literal churches. But at the same time, the commendations that God was given and the condemnations that God was given to these churches, yes, they were specific to the church. But when you do your church history, the commendations and the condemnations were also could be applied to a church age through a specific period of time. And when we get to the church of the Laodiceans, He's speaking not just to that church 2,000 years ago, but he's speaking to us. He's speaking to the individuals, today's church. And this church of the Laodiceans began somewhere around 1900, and it's to the present, and it's going to follow us all the way into the rapture. See, so what's taking place in this church now, you can now apply to the church today. And I think it's interesting, again, that he says Laodiceans. See, it's an individual issue. God is speaking to the individuals of the church today because what the, con the con uh, condemnations that he gives us is something we can rise above as individuals who come together as the church. But we have to come together. We have to see where we're at. So when you look here in verse 15, Jesus is spe speaking and he says, I know thy works that thou art neither hot nor cold or cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and the anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. In the verse that we all know, that we've all spoken, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So this is the condemnation these are the bad things that Jesus has given to the church. You can't find hardly anything good in here whatsoever. So that tells me we as a church today, we have some issues. And we're seeing a contrast between the righteousness of Jesus Christ and the self-righteousness of the church today. He says you're neither hot nor cold. He says we're lukewarm. And that makes him sick to his stomach. You know, there's, there's, you know, I remember years ago there was a, a young man and that said, I don't want to come to church because I don't want to be a hypocrite. You know what? God respects that. He wasn't hot and he wasn't cold. God says, thank you. I'm going to accept that. But if you came here to be a hypocrite and pretend, then that's what was going to make God sick. That's what was going to make him sick. We have a lot of lukewarm Christians today. And I know we've all heard many messages about this before, but this is the commonality of where we're at. See, what we are doing as a church is we're proclaiming our own goodness. We're proclaiming our own self-righteousness, and we don't even realize it at times. We get caught up into it, and we don't realize it. We justify our actions. We justify our moves. We justify our thoughts with Scripture itself when it's outside the boundaries of what God has for us. That's what the lukewarm church does. And how does Jesus say that? In John verses, uh, or chapter 7, verse 18, he says, He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. That's what Jesus says. He says that, if, that there are men out there, when they speak of themselves, they're seeking their own glory. You realize, church, that's where we're at. There's many glory seekers out there. Open up Facebook. Open up Instagram, Snapchat. Turn on ESPN. Turn on the TV and know what you're going to see. Glory seekers. People who point up here to Jesus, but then they go back to receive the praise, right? That's where we're at as a church. You show me your Facebook page, I'll show you what's important to you. You know, there's a lot of you taking the selfies and all that. I don't have to go down that. I think you guys get the point. 
But see, God is looking for people who's going to seek to worship him. He seeks worshipers who are going to worship him and glorify his name, not to seek their own glory. We're to seek the glory of God and to lift him up. That's what we're called to do. But yet the lukewarm church does something a little bit different. So it, that's what Jesus says about us right now in this age. But we've got to go back from the beginning and see what happens. So go with us over to Acts chapter 2. And Acts chapter 2 kind of gives us the formation of the church. <clears throat> Day of Pentecost has taken place. And now people are coming to know Jesus as their Savior. And where we're at, it kind of starts showing what the body of Christ is doing together. We're going to start in verse 44. And it says, And all that believe were together and had all things common. See, it doesn't matter from where you're from. It doesn't matter uh, your social status. When you come and to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have all things common. There's nothing different. God does, is no respecter of persons. See, the church now has all things common. They sold their possessions and goods imparted them to all men that every man had need. The church no longer was looking in selfishness. They were looking at how they can give, how they can help their brothers and sisters in Christ, even help the lost, I'm sure. And they continually and daily one accord in the temple and the breaking of bread from house to house. See, they were coming together in worship. We had not yet received from Paul that we are the temple. They didn't know that yet at this time. They didn't understand that we now are the temple of God. That one day would come through our apostle, Paul the apostle. But right now they're doing what they know to do. Just, just get together and worship God together. They went house to house encouraging one another in singleness of heart. That means they had one mind, one thought, one movement to glorify God together as a church. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. See, that's where the church began. See, both churches were seeking something completely different. What I mean by both is the church we read about in Revelation 3 and the church we read about in Acts chapter 2. Both were seeking something completely different, but it's the same church. It's the same those who are bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. But something drastically has gone wrong over time. Isn't that kind of a definition of our own lives? We get excited, we're walking with God, and then something drastically happens and we find ourselves way out in left field away from God. See, that happened not only in a period of 2,000 years, but it happens in our lives in a period of 70, 80 years. We have to guard our hearts from that. Something went wrong, and it was prophesied that this was going to happen through John. See, we have to get back to the model. We've got to get back to the basics We've got to get back to the place where we remember that we're singleness of heart. We're all going the same direction. The leadership here has a mind to move forward for the kingdom of God, and the church body's got to come alongside and be a part of that same vision. And praise the Lord. If you're there, praise God. Stay there. Don't move. Be unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your work will not be in vain. Bring people with you. Move forward. If you're not there, get on board. Get on the vision. Understand what we need to do as a church. Because if not, you're going to land one place or the other. You're either going to land in Acts 2 or you're going to land somewhere in Revelation chapter 3. We've got to protect our hearts. So the, what, what should be common, what should be common has now become uncommon. And to become common again it will take uncommon believers to live outside the prophecy. That's what it's going to take. See, we should be common, but we're not. If we want to get back to a place of commonality, we have to be uncommon. And in order to do so, we have to live outside of prophecy. And the beautiful thing is, we're not destined for failure because of this prophecy. He said to the Laodiceans, that means you have choice. You have a place to work this out in your own life. You have the ability to be able to go in, find out what God wants you to do, and make the change that you need to make to be faithful like him. You are an overcomer because Jesus Christ is an overcomer. Amen? We must overcome our own self-righteousness with the righteousness of Christ. And when we do this, then the faithfulness of Christ will be revealed in us. So go back over to Revelation chapter 3. Because in this passage now we're learning 
where the commonality of the church is, but yet at the same time, through this condemnation, he also is teaching us how to come out of this and what we can do. Because he gives us some counsel. There's nothing like some good counsel. And in this counsel, I believe it's also, you can connect it to 2 Corinthians 13.5. In 2 Corinthians 13.5 it says, <clears throat> Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. See, what this verse is saying through Paul is that you've got to examine, are you even in the body? And you can even, you've got to prove it. You've got to look in your own life and examine your own life, whether you're in the body and whether you're a part of the body. And some of us might, well, well yeah, of course I am. I pray for, I pray that you are. And the majority of you probably are. But you've got to examine yourself. Where do we get that? Over in Revelation chapter 3. Jesus says this, buy of me gold, in verse 18, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. You see, you have to buy in the fact that Jesus Christ is your hope. We just sang about Jesus Christ being our hope. Our yesterday's gone, amen? But he says, buy of me gold tried in the fire. See, in the Bible, gold is a picture of the deity of Jesus Christ. And he says, buy of me gold. Buy into the fact that I am gold. Buy into the fact that I am God. And I have gone through the fire, God's judgments, and I've come out on the other side 100% pure, without faith. I've come in on the other side 100% faithful. You've got to buy into the fact of who God is. You've got to buy into the fact that Jesus Christ is God. And not everybody here is bought into that fact. Christ was sacrificed on the cross 2,000 years ago. He was tried and found 100% faithful. And the beautiful thing is, he says that thou mayest be rich. He knows, God knows that if you buy in the fact that Jesus is God, you will be rich, that you will have eternity. You will spend eternity with him. But see, that what, what is the Bible saying here in Revelation 3? Don't you know that you're poor? See, there's some people that think they're rich and they're poor. And God is saying, no, you really need to get rich. And the only way you can get rich is through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross 2,000 years ago. Amen? Have you bought into the fact that Jesus Christ is God? Two, you're covering he says here, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. He's saying, I want you to be clothed. Have you bought into the fact that it's Jesus Christ's righteousness that clothes you? If, you, if you're in your own self-righteousness, the blood of Jesus Christ is that which makes you white as snow. Jesus is the only one that can take that which is red and turn it into pure white. I don't know anybody else. There's no Clorox on earth that can do that, I don't think. Because Jesus, he's the one who's done it. He's the one. And the thing is, is he says here, the last thing that God wants is for a person's nakedness to be revealed. You see, you have to buy on the fact not only is he God, but your righteousness isn't enough. It's his righteousness, the blood of Jesus Christ, that justified you just as if you've never sinned. And when you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he takes his blood and he puts it on you and you become white as snow. And when God the Father looks down on you, he says he sees his son. He sees that righteousness. He doesn't want your nakedness to be revealed because revealing is going to take place one day. And you know where it's going to take place? At the great white throne judgment. That's when the revealing is going to take place. See, church, he's talking to the church, but he's also challenging the church. Are you the church? Are you in the church? Have you bought into this fact? You see, here's the thing. God has given us a warning here and telling us that judgment is coming. And one thing we must know is God's warnings always come before judgment. He always gives you a way out. He always gives us a way so that we don't have to face his judgment. Are you taking heed to the warning? And then the last thing here is your vision. He says, anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. See, back then, during this time, somebody who had made some eye issue, they had an ointment they would put on their eyes. And that was true to help with this physical ailment, I guess. Maybe Paul would dealt with this. But yet, at the same time, it's a spiritual truth. We are blinded. Remember, he says you are blind. You, you think you have vision, but you don't. You're blind. You need to anoint your eyes with some eye salve. You need to put that on. You need to get ri rid of the physical and start looking at the spiritual. You need to re re replace some things in your life. 
You need to allow the Spirit of God to work in and through you to help you see things spiritually and stop looking at things physically. You see, this is, the, this is right here what the Lord is giving us. This is what he's trying to teach us with. This is how he's helping us walk through. See, we must rise above prophecy and take heed to wise counsel. The counsel here to this church is given based off the faithfulness of Christ. So that's what he's saying. He's saying, I'm the faithful one. I'm giving you and showing you that you're opposite of who I am right now. But it can get a little bit um, confusing here because, but, so even though the counsel here to the church is given based off the faithfulness of Christ, but what is common found in Christ is now uncommon in his church. But wait a second, you just said that we're in common. Yes, but the commonality that is found in Christ is actually made the entire church uncommon. So that means as individuals, we've got to be uncommon in faithfulness and not be the commonality of Revelation chapter 3. Does that make sense? I hope so because that can be kind of confusing. I know when I was working it out, I was trying to make sure and put all the pieces in place, right? So here we are. We know through Revelation chapter 3 and what God's telling us. So we must know where we are and allow the Bible to direct us where we need to be. We have to know. The counsel of Christ is a path for us to get back to a place of righteousness. So please, with me, go over real quickly to 2 Kings chapter 22. Because we can go many, many places, but this is where God kept leading me back. There's many examples in the Bible of where we could go look at a contrast. We've seen the contrast of unrighteousness. Now give us a sight of righteousness. And God kept leading me back to the life of Josiah. So what we're going to do here is we're going to read down through his life. We're not going to read a lot of the scripture. We don't have time for that. We will hit one verse. But I'm going to talk about his life real quick. This is the opposite of Revelation 3. Josiah, king of Judah, he was eight years old when he became king and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. When everything was crazy, the world was perverse, things were wrong and bad around him, he did that which was right. Now, why did he do that? He didn't have the Bible. He didn't have a word in front of him at this time. But you know what he did have? He had a woman by the name of Jedediah. And Jedediah, you know what her name means? It's his mother. It means beloved of God. See, he had a beloved of God right next to him at the age of eight that was leading and guiding him and helping him to make the right directions. Moms and dads, your investment matters. Continue to be a Jedediah to your children. Continue to be a Jedediah to your friends because we all need that beloved around us. Because sometimes people may not have a word of God that they can go to, but do they have a beloved of God next to them? You see, that's what took place right here. I believe that's one reason why he did that which was right in the sight of God. In his 18th year as king, while renovating the house of God, a book of God's law was found. He had it read to him, and when he read it to him, he rent his clothes and he sent to inquire of the Lord. Now look in chapter 22 of 2 Kings, verse 13. It says here, this is Josiah saying, Go ye, inquire the Lord for me and for the people and for all of Judah concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according unto all that which is written concerning us. See, Josiah knew that God's wrath was coming because they just read God's word, and God's word said God's wrath is coming. God's given them a warning. And here's what he says, they have not done all according to us. See, what he realized, that they had fell victim to what the generations before them had failed to do. The generations before failed to serve God properly, and they became victims of that. But he recognized it, and he didn't sit back and blame the past. What he did was he took responsibility. He made himself part of the we. It's just as much as my fault as the people in the past. It's just as much my fault. So he took responsibility. God's wrath then is prophesied throughout the Scripture and mercy is shown to Josiah. Now, why was that? His heart was tender, the Bible says. He humbled himself toward the Lord. He rent his clothes and he wept before the Lord. And then because of his brokenness and humility, God gave him a blessing. And you know what that blessing was? God's blessing is that he would die in peace and not see God's wrath. But do you realize Josiah died in battle? 
He died in a war. Well, where's peace in that? Where is peace? God, you promised him peace. Where is peace in that? Well, what God showed me through this. Oh, let's see here. I, actually, I think I've been, I haven't been moving. Sorry, guys. True peace is the absence of God's wrath, no matter what we face this side of eternity. That's what true peace is. It's the absence of God's wrath, no matter what you face, no matter the trials and tribulations this side of eternity, true peace is the absence of God's wrath. Well, how does that apply to you? Well, guess what? You're the church. You're bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. The wrath of God was put upon Jesus 2,000 years ago. The sins of the world came down upon him. He took your place. And the moment you said yes to God, you entered into a place of rest and true peace. And when God's wrath comes back, you will never taste of it. Amen? Praise the Lord. That's what true peace is. You've been brought into a place of peace because of God's promises to you, the blessings towards you. Josiah's response, how did he respond to everything that God just did? He didn't just sit back. You know what he did? He got after it. He got up and he did something about it. There were things around him that needed to be purged. There was evil and perversion in the country of Judah that needed to be taken out. So here's what he did. He removed all the vessels made for Baal. He killed all the idolatrous priests. He removed the grove from the house of the Lord. He broke down the houses of the Sodomites. He defiled and broke down all the high places. He defiled jo uh, Tophet, the place where people would sacrifice children. He broke down the altars that were put in place by former kings. He defiled the high places that were actually put up by Solomon. Remember, he became an idolater. He broke in pieces images and cut down groves. He slew all the priests of the high places that were upon the altars. And this is one beautiful thing. He kept the Passover. He brought the Passover. He established the Passover that had not been established and done since the time of Judges. Passover had not ever been seen. We know what the story of Passover is with Moses when he took the blood of the lamb, put on the doorposts and the lentils, and death passed by. And they would celebrate that every year of God leading them out of, the, of Egypt. But they forgot about it. They stopped doing it. He, he reinstituted that. And he put away wizards and those with familiar spirits. Josiah was like no other king before him, nor would there any be, ever be a king like him after, except for Jesus Christ, of course. See, he turned to the Lord with all of his heart, with all of his soul, and with all of his might. He became broken before God. He was the age of 26 when this took place, and he did this all in one year. You see, it can be done rather quickly. What have we accomplished this past year? We can blame COVID. We can blame the crazy political thing that's taken place. But church, we are to rise above that. Our identification is not found within politics or in sports or within covid it's not, our identification is found within Jesus Christ. And if, if we don't do something about it, there's going to be a lot of peace people who are going to find that shame at the great white throne judgment. It's our responsibility to rise up. What have we accomplished this past year? See, Josiah, he was serious. He was serious about God's word. And here's what was beautiful about him. Uncommon faithfulness will become natural in your life when you become serious about the Word of God. I mean, think about that. That uncommon faithfulness that was found in Josiah, it didn't really happen until he found God's Word and became serious about it. God is a serious God, and he expects his church to be just as serious. He recognized something. There were some pipes in Judah that were clogged, and they needed to be unclogged. There was a toilet that needed to be flushed. There were some things that had to be taken away from Judah in order for it to be pure. And you know what God is talking to the church from Revelation chapter 33? There's some things that's clogging the pipes, guys. There's some things that we need to sever out of our lives. I don't know how many times I've abled Facebook. And I got sick of it and I disabled it. Then I go back to it and able it again. You know, this can be a clog up the pipes in our life. There can be many more other things. We've got to make sure that our lives and the pipes in our life are flowing freely and purely with the Word of God. So that brings us down to this, the bookends of righteousness. 
What was it that motivated and kept him faithful from the time that he heard God's word until the day he died in battle? What was it that kept him motivated? It was the bookends of righteousness. See, bookends is that which keeps that which is in the middle from falling. You guys know what I'm talking about. You put a book in on a shelf here and here, you put it together. It keeps those books from following. Well, we have some book bookends in our lives. And what's in the middle these bookends are going to keep from following? And on one end of Josiah was the Word of God. And when he got into the Word of God, it developed something. It developed within him a heart of conviction. And he never allowed the convictions to leave him. And what that held up inside of his life was uncommon integrity. To do that which is right because it's the right thing to do. You know, as we grow, convictions change in our life. But the question is, is how are we going to respond to them? Both the word and his convictions maintained his integrity. Faithfulness here is revealed. Why? Because God squeezed him. God used the word of God to squeeze and what was inside came out. And what was it? It was integrity. The exact opposite of what we find in the church of the latest scenes. You, church, me, the individuals, what side are we going to find ourselves on? See, Josiah was faithful with his convictions. How faithful are we going to be with ours? Do we have any convictions? Are we allowing God to develop any convictions in our life? Convictions are very powerful if you allow them to work because they will keep inside of you a burden of integrity that will continue to move. See, the commonality of self-righteousness can clearly be seen in Revelation 3. The opposite of a life of uncommon righteousness is a compromised life of self-righteousness. We continually try to compromise in our life our own self-righteousness towards against God's. Like we said earlier, we have to have a baseline. If you do not go to God's word with a spiritual thought process in mind, with a spiritual context, it's going to be very difficult to discern what God is doing in your life. You have to approach it with that lens. Proverbs 11.3 says this, The integrity of the upright shall guide them. That's uncommon. But the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. See, if you have a life of integrity in your life, with the word of God on one end and your convictions of the other, you know what's going to happen? It will always lead you down a path of righteousness. It will always lead you to the face of Jesus. It's always going to lead you to where Jesus is. That's what we have to look at because we've got enough perverseness around us. The church doesn't need to help. We've got enough transgressors around us. Paul says, if I build that up, which has been torn down, I'll become a transgressor again. Why do we as a church always want to become transgressors again? We don't have to do that at all. See, we can follow the integrity that God has given us. The example of Revelation 3, Acts chapter 2, or the life of Josiah, a faithful man who can find no one can find what God will reveal. He's going to reveal it through your heart, through the trials and tribulations that you go through. See, Jesus Christ is our standard. He is our standard. And yes, we're going to face some conflicts, and those conflicts are going to cause some contrasting thoughts and processes in our minds. But if we follow after this integrity, the word of God and these convictions, I promise you, he will unclog the pipes, and he will allow his righteousness to flow throughly through your life. God is a serious God. How serious are you? The bookends of righteousness lead to an uncommon integrity. And an uncommon integrity will lead to an uncommon faithfulness. We've got to make sure that our lives are right with God. And that we're choosing one side or the other. Because if you don't, God's going to spew you out of his mouth. So I don't know where you're at today. I'm going to go to the Lord in prayer. And this is going to be an opportunity for you guys to, to spend some time with the Lord and maybe examine your lives, whether you're actually in the faith. Maybe examine your lives, whether you allowed some things in your life that has clogged the pipes. See, it's times like this that God wants his church to be clean, to be pure. See, faithfulness will come out of that. And remember this, faithfulness will come out of someone who is serious about God. How serious are you? Let's pray. Father God, thank you again for this time. Lord, you're serious about this. You are truly serious about what your word says. There's a lot of lives who are hanging in the balance. Our lives, our children's lives, our grandchildren's lives, our friends, our co-workers, 
Those we don't even know that we pass on the streets, Lord. We get so caught up with the chiefs. We get so caught up with the politics. We get so caught up with the things. And Lord, you've proven to us and shown us that we need to rise above everything this world has to offer. Because there's nothing in this world that can offer what Jesus Christ can offer. Thank you for making the church rich. Thank you for purifying us. Thank you for encouraging us. Thank you for giving us a path of righteousness. And as Laodiceans, it's an individual issue. We can rise above that and then come together as in unity with singleness of heart and mind, move forward with a vision. Lord, soon we're going to hear a trump. And when that trump happens, no more opportunities will we ever have to give our testimony or share the gospel. So Lord, may the church be found faithful. May we be uncommon through the commonality of Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you and praise you, working in through the hearts of your church, working in through the hearts of the lost. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So now you have the opportunity. You can come.